Chapter twenty six of Lands of the Caribbean by Frank G. Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Land of Columbus. The steamer I boarded at Port au Prince is approaching the ancient city of Santo Domingo, the capital of the Dominican Republic and the oldest existing settlement founded by white men in the Western Hemisphere. It was begun by Bartolomeu Columbus, the brother of the Admiral, in fourteen ninety six only four years after the discovery of the new world, and it witnessed more events connected with the life of Columbus than any other spot in America. In the early days of its existence, it was his headquarters for other expeditions. A few years afterward, it was the scene of his bitterest hours when he was thrown into prison and then carried to Spain in chains, and now its great cathedral is claimed to be the repository of his remains. As we enter the mouth of the Ozama River, on the west bank of which lies the city, we are in the midst of scenes steeped in historical associations. It was on these shores that Sir John Hawkins, bringing a shipload of Negroes into Sierra Leone, traded his human cargo for gold, spices, sugar, and hides, England's first slave traffic in the West Indies. To the west is the beach upon which Sir Francis Drake, coming here a few years after his memorable voyage around the world, landed his men to make an attack upon the stronghold of the Spaniards. Farther up the river is the very Ceiba tree to which, so the Dominicans claim, Columbus tied his caravels when he first came to this spot. Towering high above the bluff where the Ozama empties into the sea is the citadel built at the command of Columbus's son, Diego. It is the oldest fort to be found in America today antedating the moros of havana and santiago de cuba by several years four centuries ago its frowning walls witnessed the departure from santo domingo of such adventurers as velasquez ponce de leon cortez and pizarro as they set forth to explore and conquer the rest of the west indies and the mainland of america the fort is now used as a prison and one of its cells is pointed out by guides as the place where Columbus was incarcerated. However, as the city at that time was located on the opposite bank of the river, this story can safely be said to have been originated purely for the benefit of credulous tourists. In front of us is Santo Domingo itself, surrounded by its ancient wall. This wall, although broken through in many places and in others covered with vegetation, still encloses the city as it did in the past. Above it, silhouetted Against the bright blue of the tropical sky are the time-worn towers of once magnificent buildings. That huge, roofless, windowless ruin we see rising high over the wall is all that remains of the massive Casa de Colón, the residence built by Diego Columbus when he came here as governor of Santo Domingo in 1509. In the days when it was presided over by the Spanish noblewoman whom Diego had married, it was the most handsome building of the city, but it has long since fallen into decay and is now used as a stable for donkeys, goats, and pigs. Santa Domingo was originally founded on the east bank of the Ozama and grew rapidly in size and importance. As time went on, the Spaniards associated with Columbus became jealous of him and sent back to Spain reports accusing him of arrogance and injustice. The Spanish sovereigns were already disappointed because the fabulous wealth they had expected from the New World was not yet forthcoming, and were willing enough to send a committee to America to investigate these charges. This was headed by one Bobadilla, who, overstepping his authority, caused the discoverer of America and his brother to be confined in the fort and then sent back to Spain as prisoners. This outrage, however, incensed Ferdinand and Isabella. They ordered Columbus's immediate release restored to him his property and honors, and sent out another governor to replace Bobadilla. In June 1502, Columbus came back to Santo Domingo on his fourth voyage, putting into a nearby cove for shelter during a storm. The hurricane that followed almost completely destroyed the settlement, and soon afterward its inhabitants moved to the opposite shore of the river and began a new city. The glory of Santo Domingo proved to be short-lived, with the discovery of the wealth of Mexico and Peru, the covetous eyes of Spain were turned to the mainland, 
and the importance of this city rapidly declined. In the years between the middle of the 16th century and the end of the 18th, it played little part in the development of the New World. The chief event of that period in the island's history seems to have been the attack on the city made by Sir Francis Drake, which took place on the last day of the year 1585. That venturesome British navigator had come to the West Indies with 25 ships and 2,300 men, the largest fleet that had ever crossed the Atlantic. He landed about half of his men in the dead of night, and next morning, while the Spaniards were preparing for an attack by sea, the British marched upon and captured Santo Domingo from the rear. Drake held Santo Domingo for four weeks. He looted it of everything of value he could find and then proceeded to burn it, because an additional large ransom was not paid. One writer of that day relates that each morning at daybreak, 200 men were sent forth to set fire to the buildings of the city, continuing at this work until the heat of the day drove them indoors. However, the stone structures were so hard to destroy that only a third of the city was demolished. Drake eventually tired of his incendiary occupation, accepted the 25,000 ducats that the citizens agreed to pay him, relieved the city of its 80 cannon, and sailed onward to new adventures about the Caribbean, finally returning to England by way of Florida and Virginia. Seventy years later, an unsuccessful attempt to capture Santo Domingo was made by Admiral Penn while he was on his way to attack Jamaica. Not long afterward, the city was further damaged by earthquakes and hurricanes, and from that time on its importance continued to diminish. In 1737, Father Valverde wrote that it had only 500 people and that more than half of the buildings of the capital were entirely ruined. Of those still standing, two-thirds were uninhabitable or closed, and the other third was more than enough for the population. Leaving this picture of the rise and fall of the Santo Domingo of the past, let us go ashore and see something of the city today. It now has a population of 30,000, and in appearance it is a curious mixture of crumbling grandeur and modern ugliness. Its streets are wider than those of Old Havana and have been more or less improved. Its buildings, likewise, are mostly of the modern type found throughout much of the West Indies, and as we walk along we see picture theaters, newspaper offices, and well-stocked stores kept largely by Syrians, Spaniards, and Puerto Ricans. In the afternoons, when the band plays in the plaza, well-dressed Dominicans mingle with the poorer natives in the crowds on the streets. Everywhere we turn, however, we are confronted with remains of the Santo Domingo of 400 years ago. Here the ruins of a massive stone mansion tower above the straw-thatched roofs of a humble native home, and there a great carved doorway, a fine old balcony, or a grilled window, hints of ancient splendors. Stores, stables, and lumber yards occupy the remains of stone buildings, Moorish in design, and rubbish, reeking garbage, and lines of drying clothes now clutter once spacious courtyards and patios. Nearly every old building has its legends and half-forgotten tales of secret passages, underground vaults, and buried treasure hidden by the Spaniards during revolutions or enemy attacks. One of these crumbling walls of Santo Domingo marks the site of the first university founded in this hemisphere, Las Casas. The friend of Columbus and historian of his time is said to have taught there once. Another ancient ruin is all that remains of San Nicolas, the oldest Christian church in America. It was built early in the 16th century by Governor Ovando, probably as a conscious offering because of his massacres of the Indians. Under the oppression of this governor, tens of thousands of natives were killed or driven to suicide. One of his atrocities was to send out a detachment of 300 men under Diego Velazquez, the future conqueror of Cuba, to massacre the subjects of Queen Anna Cayona, one of the last two native rulers left on the island. The queen herself was brought to Santo Domingo and executed because, so her captors said, she was not sincere in professing the Catholic religion. North of the city is the ruin of the Monastery of San Francisco, erected by the Franciscan monks about 1504 and said to have been the burial place of Bartholomew Columbus. 
It was badly damaged by an earthquake in 1824. At one time it was used as a Methodist church by Negro immigrants from the United States, and today a part of it has been rebuilt as an asylum for the insane. The most famous church in Santo Domingo is, of course, the cathedral containing the remains of Columbus. Built between 1512 and 1540, it originally covered an area as large as two city blocks and was once the richest shrine in the New World. It faces the park in which the British soldiers encamped when Drake plundered the city, and in its roof is embedded a cannonball that some claim is a memento of the visit of that dashing Englishman. It is more likely, however, that it came from the guns of the British forces who tried to take the city from the French in 1809. The cathedral has withstood the shaking of earthquakes, the bombardments of enemy fleets, and the battering of pirate hordes. Today it bears the marks of all those vicissitudes and makes little claim to architectural beauty. The interior is more attractive. The nave is flanked by lofty columns supporting a groined ceiling, and the altar is faced with plates of silver taken from native mines with a background of wood richly gilded. On each side are chapels and shrines containing sacred relics. What are believed to be the remains of Columbus are enshrined in a mausoleum of marble and bronze, its entrance guarded by two bronze lions. The claim that this cathedral contains the bones of Columbus probably will be always in dispute, although most impartial historians entertain no doubt of it. Columbus died, you will remember, in Spain, his body being interred first in Valladolid and then in Seville. In his will, he had expressed a desire to be buried in Santo Domingo, and his remains were finally brought to this cathedral in 1540, together with those of his son Diego, who had died in 1526. Unfortunately, if there were any official records of the transfer, they were lost or destroyed, and two centuries later, there was only tradition to tell where Columbus was buried. In 1795, when Spain ceded Santo Domingo to France, it was decided to remove the bones of the great discoverer from under a foreign flag and take them to Havana. At that time, no one thought that the casket moved was other than that of Columbus. The first intimation that a mistake might have been made came 82 years later, when workmen making repairs in the Santo Domingo Cathedral discovered a leaden casket with the initials of Columbus on the outside. Inside, among the dust and crumbling bones, were an inscription bearing his name and a bullet, supposedly the one that it was known he had carried in his leg to the time of his death. When the discovery was investigated by members of the Spanish Academy, they still maintained that the remains taken to Havana had been those of Columbus, and not of his son Diego, as claimed by the Dominicans. Nevertheless, the Dominicans were so certain that the casket found here was the right one that they erected for it the magnificent mausoleum in which it now reposes. To see something of the land Columbus loved so well, we must take a motor car from Santo Domingo City. One cannot go inland by rail, as the only two railroads, aside from the private sugar lines, are on the north coast. In its natural aspects, we find the eastern part of the island much like Haiti, with even higher mountains. One of its peaks, Monte Tina, rises almost two miles above the level of the sea and is the loftiest in all the west indies the chief mountain range densely wooded runs east and west through the center of the country with lower coastal ranges between which are fertile valleys sugar the principal crop of the country is grown mainly in the south where several large plantations have been established in recent years cacao tobacco and coffee are produced on a large scale and together with sugar, form the only important exports from the country, although practically all the fruits and vegetables of the islands of the West Indies are grown here. There are large areas of grazing land that furnish pasture for herds of cattle and goats, and there are known to be extensive mineral deposits, including gold, iron, coal, copper, petroleum, and salt. Probably the first gold the Spaniards obtained in the New World came from here, and in the early years, the island yielded many a fortune in this metal, washed from the gravel of the mountain streams by Indian slaves under the lash of Spanish 
Taskmasters. In language and customs, Santo Domingo and Haiti are as dissimilar as Spain and France. The population here is only one-fourth as dense as in the western end of the island, but most of the people are landowners, more progressive and prosperous than the Haitians. The country homes are larger and neater than those of Haiti, and the methods of farming more up-to-date. Modern agricultural implements have been introduced on the larger plantations. The Dominican people themselves are of a type superior to the average in Haiti. Although the majority of the population are of mixed Spanish, African, and Indian blood, there is a small element of pure whites, consisting of descendants of the early colonial families and of immigrants who have come here more recently. The people like to be considered white, and they bitterly resented the former practice of the United States in sending colored men here as ministers and consuls. Among the better classes, the girls are strictly chaperoned until they marry, although in recent years many of them have begun to work in offices as clerks and stenographers. As in Haiti, there is practically no middle class. The great mass of the people are poor and uneducated, but the voodooism and barbarous practices found in the adjoining republic do not exist here. The political history of Santo Domingo has been turbulent, but not so bloody as that of Haiti. Between 1844, when it became independent of Spain, and 1914, 19 constitutions were promulgated and 53 presidents were put out of office. In 1904, the government was unable to pay the interest on its foreign loans. In accordance with the provisions of one of these loans, the United States thereupon took over the collection of the customs at the port of Puerto Plata. Three years later, a general receivership of all the Dominican customs was provided for in a convention between Santo Domingo and the United States. At the same time, our government arranged for a refunding loan through American bankers with which to pay off the European obligations of Santo Domingo and give the country a fresh start. Within eight years after taking charge of the Dominican customs receipts, the United States had reduced the national debt from 32 to $21 million, and it started the Republic on the road to financial stability. In spite of this, a faction of the government remained hostile to what they called our interference. As a result, political disturbances followed, to suppress which the Dominicans incurred new debts without Washington's approval. Affairs came to a crisis in 1916 when United States Marines were landed to put down an insurrection and in November of that year, we set up here a military government, an officer of the United States Navy, assuming the duties of the Dominican president. That administration lasted eight years, functioning most of the time in the face of much adverse criticism on the part of Americans as well as Dominicans, but nevertheless bringing about a vast improvement in the condition of the country. The military government was replaced on July 12, 1924, by a native president and vice president. And on the afternoon of the same day, the United States flag was lowered from the fort and the withdrawal of the American troops began. The customs receivership, however, still remains in force. As in Haiti, much of the present industrial and economic development of Santo Domingo took place in the years of the American occupation. During that time, the customs revenues increased from 700,000 to almost $4 million a year. The first census of the country was taken, a property tax was inaugurated, many old land titles were cleared, and import duties were lowered on agricultural and other machinery. Banditry was put down in the isolated regions, and mounted marines of our Navy patrolled the railways and trails to safeguard communications. In 1915, the Dominican Republic did not own a single school building, the few schools it supported being housed in rented quarters. Ninety percent of the people were wholly illiterate, and the private schools that existed were without modern educational standards or methods. The children of well-to-do parents were educated in Europe, or if their complexions were light enough to enable them to pass for whites in the United States. Today, the rural schools number ten times as many as there were a decade ago. Advanced schools have been established, 
teacher salaries have been increased and the enrollment of children has been increased from 18,000 to 100,000 pupils. An improved road system is another thing that Santo Domingo acquired during the American occupation. A modern highway built from Santo Domingo to Santiago de los Caballeros has brought the latter city, the second largest in the Republic, within four hours of the capital by automobile. This road ends at the port of Monte Cristi on the north coast, where it joins the Haitian road passing through Cape Haitian to Port-au-Prince. The motor trip between the capitals of the two republics can be made in less than two and a half days. Another road has been built westward from Santo Domingo and will eventually reach Port-au-Prince by a route more than a day shorter. At the same time, improvements have been made in the harbor works of the cities reached by these new roads. The port of Macoris has a modern concrete pier more than 600 feet long. La Romana has a new wharf and Santo Domingo itself has had its docks and wharves largely rebuilt. End of chapter 26. Chapter 27 of Lands of the Caribbean by Frank G. Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. By motor across Puerto Rico. Come with me this morning for a motor ride across Puerto Rico, Uncle Sam's Garden Island of the West Indies. Lying at the eastern end of the Greater Antilles, it is washed on the north by the Atlantic and on the south by the blue waters of the Caribbean. Forty-five miles to the west, across the Mona Passage, is Santo Domingo, whence I have come, and less than that distance to the eastward are the Virgin Islands, which, like Puerto Rico, belong to the United States. Before we begin our trip across the island, let me give you a bird's eye view of Puerto Rico. It is rectangular in shape, and with the exception of a fringe of low land bordering the coast, it is all mountains and narrow V-shaped valleys. The highest mountain range extends through the center of the island from west to east, branching out near the eastern end in two spurs. This ridge resembles a pitchfork with two great tines and a long handle. The handle of the fork stretches from the western end of the island 60 miles to the eastward, and each of the tines is about 40 miles long. Not far from where they join is El Yunque, or the Anvil, one of the highest points in Puerto Rico. It is 3,600 feet above the level of the sea and can be seen from far out on the ocean. A tract of 65,000 acres of forest surrounding it has been set aside as a forest reserve and will someday probably be converted into a tropical park. As to climate, I doubt whether Puerto Rico ever gets as hot in summer as do some parts of Ohio and Indiana, and certainly not as hot as Washington often is during July and August. The average temperature here the year round is about 80 degrees, and for 20 years the thermometer has never registered more than 92. It is true that the humidity is high, but it is always offset by the breezes from the Atlantic, which are so full of ozone that they are as stimulating as a cocktail. Compared in size to the United States, Puerto Rico is little more than a garden patch. It is smaller than our state of Connecticut and would hardly be a freckle on the broad face of Texas. Its average width is not so great as the distance from Washington to Baltimore, and its length is about that from Baltimore to Philadelphia. There is no place in it more than 18 miles from the sea, and in a motor car one can travel from coast to coast in a few hours. Notwithstanding its small area, however, Puerto Rico has a more dense population than any other island in the West Indies. It has between 13 and 1,400,000 people, or almost 300 to the square mile. In other words, the equivalent of every 160-acre farm is supporting an average of 70 persons. Unlike the population in Haiti and Santo Domingo, the majority of the Puerto Ricans are pure white, only one-fourth being blacks or mulattoes. Our journey across Puerto Rico begins at Ponce, the chief port on the south coast, and the second largest city on the island. The route we shall follow is over the famous military road built by the Spaniards. It is 84 miles long, winding its way across the mountains from here to San Juan, the capital, on the north coast. It is as smooth and well-made 
as any highway in the United States, notwithstanding its having been cut right out of the mountainsides. The military highway, including its branches, was practically the only good road in Puerto Rico when it passed into our possession. Today, the island has almost 800 miles of first-class roads, including a route between Ponce and San Juan that goes around the western end of the island instead of crossing the mountains. The country is divided into 12 road districts, each in charge of an overseer and a force of foremen and road menders. Every mender has under his immediate supervision a little more than one mile of road, which he is required to keep constantly in good repair. A certain part of his time must be spent also in setting out trees along the roadsides and in pruning the ones already planted. The highway system of Puerto Rico is much superior to the railway system, which consists of only one line reaching four-fifths of the distance about the island. Beginning at Guayama, near the eastern end of the south coast, it extends west through Ponce, north along the west coast, and thence east to beyond San Juan. It is planned some day to encircle the island completely. Leaving Ponce in our automobiles, we make our way through the low coastlands, passing vast sugar plantations. The black earth is covered with a rich growth of pale green cane, above which the black smokestacks of the sugar mills stand out against the sky. Many of them are old mills that have been abandoned since the establishment of the large modern centrales, in which most of the cane is now ground. In Puerto Rico, as in Cuba, sugar is the chief product. One-tenth of the total area is devoted to its cultivation, the plantations forming a green necklace all around the island. The annual output of nearly a half million tons forms more than 50% of all Puerto Rico's exports, and today brings in between 40 and $50 million a year, as compared with $5 million a year when the Americans first came here. Most of the plantations are in large holdings. Some support centrales that grind thousands of tons of cane a day, employ armies of workers, and own great numbers of oxen for hauling the cane to their private railway lines. Now we are in the foothills. How dry the mountains look in the distance. They make us think of the Alleghenies in August, and as we rise higher, we search in vain for the rich tropical luxuriance we expected to see. The fact is that parts of the southern slope of Puerto Rico, though naturally fertile, are decidedly arid because the water-laden winds from the Atlantic lose their moisture in passing over the highest mountains. Much of this area was irrigated by the Spaniards, the remains of whose irrigation works are still to be seen. The present government is engaged in reclaiming this land and has constructed dams to hold back the rivers and ensure a steady water supply. The water thus harnessed serves two purposes, first generating electricity for lighting the nearby towns and then flowing into the irrigation canals of the plantations. Twenty miles from Ponce we reach the town of Coamo, once noted as the Monte Carlo of Puerto Rico. During the Spanish regime it was filled with gamblers courting Dame Fortune at roulette and other games, as well as with health seekers attracted here by the medicinal hot springs. Today, the gambling concessions have disappeared, but the place is still a popular health resort. Its hotel is one of the few modern ones in Puerto Rico, being under the same management as the new Condado Vanderbilt in San Juan. Beyond Coamo, the real ascent of the mountains begins. We climb steadily until we reach Ay Benito, a little city in the pass through the range that divides the island. We are now at an altitude more than a half mile above sea level and are in one of the most picturesque regions about the Caribbean. On all sides, as far as we can see, are billowy mountains, darkened here and there by the shadows of the clouds. Below us is the military road, winding its snake-like way toward the coast in great loops and curves. Just above were the Spanish earthworks that overlooked the road when American troops invaded the island in 1898. We can climb up and stand on the very spot where their cannon thundered a warning to our soldiers. So well was the highway commanded by the Spanish fortifications that it is doubtful whether our forces could have gone much farther had not their march been stopped by the peace between the two countries. Another little city near the mountain divide is Calle, in the center of the tobacco lands of Puerto Rico. 
the dark green plants cover the mountains nearly to their summits many of the fields being so steep that the workers almost have to lean backward to hoe the crop much of the tobacco is grown under cover and the country is splotched with what in the distance look for all the world like huge circus tents pitched on the hillsides or when seen from above like mountain lakes at the time of my first visit to puerto rico shortly after the spanish-american war i saw tobacco drying in open sheds made of poles roofed with thatch it was badly cured and was so cheap that i could buy a cigar for a cent the chewing tobacco used by the natives was sold by the yard it was cured with rum and molasses and twisted into ropes about one hundred feet long and as thick as my finger a half cent's worth would equal the amount contained in the ordinary pocket plug sold in the united states since then new methods of cultivating and curing the crop have been introduced and tobacco today ranks next to sugar as a money crop of this island the leaf raised in one district near here is almost as fine as that from the vuelta abajo in cuba some of it is shipped to havana to be made into cigars and some is manufactured in puerto rico the town of caguas not far from here has three large cigar factories the scenery between calle and caguas on the north slope of the mountains is a panorama of ever-changing beauty sometimes it reminds me of japan and sometimes of the mountains of korea or the hills of china there are wooded regions that equal the blue ridge mountains in their soft hazy beauty and others where the hills are covered with grass on which fat cattle are feeding now we go past fields fenced with barbed wire not unlike the rolling farm country of pennsylvania and now past tracts of land surrounded by hedges of wild pineapples so prickly that the stock will not go through them again we are in the middle of thick semi-tropical vegetation where some of the trees are festooned with spanish moss and others are covered with great masses of bright red yellow or purple blossoms here we see cotton trees bearing big balls of white fleece and ferns some of which grow to a height of between twenty and thirty feet notice those fields of banana plants over there they have leaves of soft green a foot wide and as long as a man what a lot of palms there are and how many varieties the most conspicuous trees on every landscape are the royal palms looming like tall spires against the hills along the coast the coconut palms are especially numerous and are bringing in a considerable share of puerto rico's annual revenue they begin to bear at five years of age after which they will yield their owner an average of a dollar per tree and that without cultivation oranges pineapples and grapefruit also are exported in large quantities the grapefruit industry in particular having increased enormously in recent years cotton is now an important crop and cacao is being raised in considerable amounts the whole north slope of puerto rico is wonderfully fertile but much of it is so ragged and hilly that if it were in the united states we should not think it could be cultivated here however the moisture gives the soil such a thick growth of earth binders that it does not wash away practically the whole island is susceptible of cultivation and farming will continue to increase as fast as roads are built to carry the products to market one of the chief crops of puerto rico is coffee during the spanish regime it was the principal product of the island then in eighteen ninety nine came the great hurricane that destroyed so many of the plantations since then the industry has never recovered its former place and in the lowlands more and more sugar plantations are being set out on the former coffee lands nevertheless the puerto rican coffee is as good as any i have ever tasted and brings a high price in europe as we go on down the mountains we pass through many little cities and towns all are built on much the same pattern each surrounding a central plaza on which face the church and the principal buildings the homes of the more prosperous are built of stucco or wood and those of the poorer classes of palm boards and leaves out in the country the average dwelling is made of a framework of poles tied together over this palm leaves are laid and other poles about as thick as broomsticks are tied horizontally across the walls to hold the leaves together the floor is on stilts to afford a shelter beneath it for the pigs and the chickens 
Usually the hogs are tethered to stakes by ropes tied about their necks. In some places, even the chickens are tied. As we go by, we can look into these primitive homes, for the doors are wide open. The houses contain almost no furniture. In some, the people sleep on the floor. In others, the owners have a few hammocks, a bed, or a number of cots, made in the fashion of sawbucks, with canvas stretched over them, so that they can be folded up and set aside during the day. The cooking is done in a little lean-to at the back, the stove rarely being more than an iron pot set upon a few stones over burning charcoal. The nearest river or creek serves as a laundry. Many times we cross bridges over mountain streams in which scores of washerwomen, barefooted and bare-legged, are sitting in the water and pounding the dirt from the family clothing. Others have spread the washed garments out on the grass and are sprinkling them from time to time so that the hot sun will bleach them. The farm workers of Puerto Rico are known as gibaros and number about 60% of the population. Although they are often dark-skinned, they are usually of pure white descent. Occasionally a trace of Indian ancestry may be seen in their prominent cheekbones. They are naturally intelligent and quiet and are, on the whole, good citizens and excellent workers. Both men and women dress in cottons and all go barefooted. Some of the women we see have naked babies in their arms, and older children, equally innocent of clothing, play about in front of the huts. They are bright-eyed little things, but many of them look lean and undernourished, except at the waist, where their abdomens protrude to an enormous extent. The great majority of the children have what are known as banana bellies, caused by eating a great deal of this fruit from babyhood on. The staple diet of the Gibaros consists of bananas and sweet potatoes, varied by rice, beans, and salted codfish when the family finances permit. The codfish is stewed with the rice and beans, and so much is consumed throughout the island that the annual imports of this one commodity often amount to $2 million worth. Few Gibaros are able to own a cow, and if the children have milk to drink, it is from goats. These animals are found all over Puerto Rico, even in crowded city streets, where they wander about among pedestrians and motor cars. As we near San Juan, the traffic on the military road increases mile by mile. Automobiles, trucks, and buses dash along in both directions. Motor vehicles now furnish most of the passenger and freight transportation in the island, and this road over which we are riding is one of the main traveled routes. However, the traffic is by no means entirely made up of motor cars. There are natives on foot, slow-moving ox carts, horse-drawn carriages, and pack ponies carrying merchandise in panniers slung over their backs. Many of them are ridden by charcoal vendors who are bringing this fuel down from their kilns in the hills. Farther on, we pass a man leading a mule laden with two huge baskets of oranges. We stop and ask the price. He tells us the fruit is exceptionally fine and that he cannot possibly sell it at less than four cents a dozen. We buy some, and as we go on, eat it in native Puerto Rican style. This means removing the peel, cutting a piece from the top, and then sucking out the juice. Oranges are much liked by these people, and at the railway stations and street corners are often sold already peeled. End of chapter 27「Chapter twenty eight of Lands of the Caribbean by Frank G. Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In San Juan. I entered San Juan by way of one of the bridges that lead from the mainland of Puerto Rico to the little island off the north coast on which the capital city lies. San Juan has the finest harbor and the only fortified one in Puerto Rico. The oldest section of the city itself is enclosed by a great wall in some places nearly a hundred feet high. At the northwest corner, rising above the sheer cliff on the Atlantic side, is Morro Castle, completed in 1584, and to the east is the fort of San Cristobal, deep down under which are the dungeons and torture chambers of the Spanish. El Morro's three tiers of batteries facing the sea and commanding the entrance to the harbor used to constitute one of the strongest fortifications in Spanish America. Today they are obsolete, and in place of the Spanish troops 
once quartered there a portion of the puerto rican regiment of the united states army now occupies the fort i first visited san juan just after puerto rico had been taken over by the united states when conditions in the city were much the same as those our health inspectors had found in havana the streets were rough and full of rubbish and of sanitary regulations there were none there were fifteen hundred cesspools in the city most of them adjoining cisterns and wells many had not been cleaned for years the majority were without cemented bottoms and all were more or less leaky it was indeed a wonder the whole population was not afflicted with typhoid fever all this has since been changed by the sanitary measures inaugurated by the americans the city today has modern sewerage and water systems and the paved main streets are clean and well kept the chief government and business buildings are about the plaza principal one of the three large central squares in the city the best and most modern appearing shops carry american goods and their clerks speak english they appear to be busy all day long except between the hours of twelve and two when most of the inhabitants of san juan take their midday siesta on the less important streets the retail establishments are the cave-like stores so common in latin american cities they seem exceedingly small but are always filled with buyers and sellers the shop signs as a rule do not carry the names of the owners and give no indication of the type of merchandise for sale a notion store is named la perla or the pearl opposite it is a dry goods establishment over which i see the words el gallo de oro meaning the golden clock and farther down the street is a hardware store labeled the flower of july a place known as la nina or the maiden sells men's shirts and hats and a barber shop is called the daughter of borinquen some of the business of san juan is still done by street vendors who cry their wares all day long here comes a man peddling chickens shouting at the top of his voice and holding out one of the three dozen squawking fowls he has tied together by their legs and slung over his shoulders but see those queer bundles he has under his arm out of them stick what look like feather dusters but which are really the tails of live turkeys the legs and wings of each turkey are bound around with strings and the fowl then wrapped up in thick palm bark in this way the peddler can carry three or four of them without interfering with the chickens thrown over his shoulders asking as to prices we find that turkeys are exceedingly cheap and the price of chickens high as we talk to this peddler another man comes up with a round bushel basket slung upon his back it is filled with eggs packed in dried leaves other vendors are selling candy ice cream and fruit especially oranges peeled in the puerto rican style some of them carry their wares on their shoulders and others push hand carts weaving their way in and out among the carriages bicycles motor cars and buses these buses by the way are often decorated with religious mottoes and it is not unusual to see one tearing along a road at top speed with in god we trust painted in huge letters on each side they make a great noise for every puerto rican motor car driver seems to delight in blowing his horn as often as he can walking along the streets we meet well-dressed men women and school children laborers in cotton garments and now and then a negro or mulatto there are many beggars although they are by no means so numerous as they were during the spanish regime saturday is known as beggars day here in the capital and at that time the merchants lay in a stock of pennies to distribute to all who ask for alms except for some of the newest business structures most of the buildings of san juan are of one or two stories with overhanging balconies jutting out above the sidewalks the homes of the wealthy are of moorish spanish architecture with flat roofs grilled windows massive doors and open patios on many streets the upper floors are occupied by the rich and the ground floor by the poor in the most congested district inside the city walls thousands live in quarters more like catacombs than the homes of human beings the rooms here are from ten to twelve feet square many of them without any light except from the door and with no ventilation at night except through holes cut in the walls just under the ceiling in such rooms live families of six ten fifteen and sometimes twenty 
sleeping on the floor or open cots that are taken outside during the day most of the rooms are so small that the people do their cooking and washing out in common courts the cooking is done over little iron bowls filled with charcoal each with a hole in the bottom to provide a draft such a bowl is only about as large as a good-sized wash basin and is so small that but one thing can be cooked on it at a time in some of the courts we see a dozen women preparing their meals while naked babies play about underfoot in recent years an effort has been made to relieve the congested conditions in the slum quarters of san juan by erecting a village of working men's homes in one of the suburbs about a thousand small dwellings of wood or concrete have been built there and let out to dependable tenants for a small monthly rental the house becoming the property of the occupant after a certain number of payments have been made each home has enough ground for a small garden and for the children to play in the open but do not think that all the residents of san juan are poor the city is prosperous and there are thousands of well-to-do people who live in beautiful homes here or in the suburbs the most imposing structure in the city is the residence of the american governor who occupies the palace of the former spanish captains general overlooking the harbor and moro castle from its windows one can see another old spanish building now taken over by the government this is the casa blanca or white house which was built by juan ponce de leon two and a half centuries before our white house at washington was begun during my stay in san juan i have attended a reception at the governor's palace and have also been present at a dance given at the largest theater in the city which was converted into a ballroom for the occasion at both places i was impressed by the beauty of the puerto rican girls they are pure spanish in type and whether garbed in the picturesque spanish shawl and comb or in the latest styles from paris they are a modish and smart looking as any of our debutantes at home many of them have been educated in europe or the united states and others belong to old families that own huge estates here but spend most of each year in spain formerly a girl of this class was rarely seen in public and never alone with a young man since the coming of the americans these conventions have been largely discarded and the fair puerto ricans now enjoy much the same freedom as their sisters in the states i see them motoring about the city and the suburbs attending the horse races and carnivals and in short patronizing sports of all kinds the puerto ricans are fond of gambling and betting and it was a blow to many of them when uncle sam prohibited bull and cockfighting and many of the popular games of chance when i first visited this island i was surprised to see so many men and boys flying kites the strings of the kites had been soaked with glue and dusted with powdered glass and each flyer tried to cut the string of his opponent's kite by making his own rub against it when one of the glass dusted strings touched an ordinary cord it sawed through it like a knife and the knife thus loosened sailed away or dropped to the ground it seemed odd to me that the people should be so excited by these kite fights until i learned that every man and boy had a bet on some kite and that varying sums from pennies to dollars changed hands each time the kite strings were cut now let me tell you something of the history of san juan it was founded by ponce de leon only a decade after the first settlement of santa domingo and several years before havana and santiago de cuba came into existence puerto rico had previously been discovered by columbus who stopped here in fourteen ninety three to replenish his water supply while on his way back to the colony he had founded in santo domingo on a previous trip in fifteen o eight ponce de leon then governor of eastern santo domingo came to puerto rico and established a settlement at capara on the north coast two years later he abandoned that location in favor of the present site of san juan which he called san juan de batista de puerto rico eventually the city came to be known as merely san juan and the island is puerto rico or as it is now commonly written puerto rico it was from this port that ponce de leon sailed in fifteen twelve to seek the legendary island containing the fountain of youth a quest he continued intermittently until his death in havana in 1521 from there his remains were brought back to puerto rico to find a final resting place in the city he had founded 
in the meantime the spaniards had begun to cultivate the island and to enslave the natives having been made to believe that the whites were immortal the indians for a long time were afraid to rebel against their lot or to harm any of their persecutors finally two of them driven to desperation by their cruel treatment decided to discover the truth for themselves and one day while carrying a spaniard across a stream they dropped him into the water and held him beneath the surface several hours then they laid his body on the bank and sat beside it for two days watching for a sign of life when at last convinced that their conquerors like themselves were mortal beings the aborigines spread the news among their tribesmen who uprose in the rebellion that eventually led to their complete extermination the only remains of the indians in puerto rico today are the native stone implements occasionally found in a grave or in a long forgotten cave there are such caves in all parts of the island many of which are worth a trip of exploration on the north coast about seven miles southeast of arecibo is an almost perpendicular rock more than three hundred feet high in the side of which is a grotto containing a number of chambers and arched passageways it has stalactites said to be comparable with those of the famous caverns of luray in virginia another remarkable cave not far from the center of the island is entered by a narrow passage about three hundred feet long and fifteen feet high which opens into a series of large chambers alive with bats exploring it is a risky undertaking as the floor is filled with holes seemingly bottomless the caverns at this place extend on and on for a long distance one opening on to another they form in fact a natural catacomb only a part of which has been explored enough is known however to be sure that they are one of the greatest natural wonders of this island like every other port in the west indies and along the spanish main san juan was harassed during the sixteenth seventeenth and eighteenth centuries by the attacks of pirates and buccaneers both sir john hawkins and sir francis drake honored it with a visit and later came back together for a joint attempt to capture the city that voyage proved to be the last that either of those famous british navigators made to the caribbean hawkins died at sea off the eastern end of puerto rico thus being spared the final humiliation of sharing in his partner's unsuccessful attack on san juan defeated and discouraged drake then sailed for panama and met his death off old portobello the scene of one of the earlier triumphs of his privateering career at the end of the eighteenth century another british squadron attempted to capture san juan but it too was unsuccessful thereafter the city existed in comparative peace until it was bombarded by admiral sampson a century later that was while our battleships were looking for Cervera's fleet, before the Spanish admiral had been located in the harbor of Santiago. Shortly afterward, General Nelson A. Miles, with 4,000 American troops, landed at Ponce and started to march over the military road to San Juan. Before any real fighting had occurred, the peace protocol was signed by the United States and Spain, and the same year Puerto Rico passed into the possession of the United States. During the first two decades of our ownership of this island, Puerto Rico remained little more than a name to most people in the United States. Now it is becoming known to us principally because of its attractions as a winter resort. This is not surprising when you realize that San Juan is only 1,400 miles from New York and that the frequent and quick steamship services bring the sunshine and scenery of this beautiful island within four days of the snow and sleet of our north atlantic coast another attraction for tourists is the use of the english language and united states currency in puerto rico also san juan has now a new hotel as modern as the best in havana and beautifully located in one of the suburbs end of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of lands of the caribbean by Frank G. Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. American Achievements in Puerto Rico. One of the most striking achievements of American rule in this island is the way Uncle Sam has linked up the dynamo of modern education with the school system of Puerto Rico. When I first came here in 1899, 
just after we took over the island, not one in forty of the then seven hundred thousand population could read or write. Nominally, there were five hundred schools supported by the Spanish government, but in reality, there was only one public school building, practically all the classes being held in private houses. The teachers received salaries that were pitifully small, and attendance was irregular. I remember that when a United States inspector visited one of the principal schools of the city at the beginning of our regime, he found that the teacher and all the pupils had declared a holiday and gone off to a cockfight. Nowhere were girls and boys allowed to attend the same schools, and if a town could not afford a separate establishment for each sex, the girls went without any schooling. Such were the conditions Uncle Sam found something more than a quarter century ago. Now let me tell you of the situation today. I have just come from a long talk with the Commissioner of Education, a native of Puerto Rico who is at the head of the school system of this island. Some of the things he told me, no doubt, will be a surprise to those at home who still look upon Puerto Rico as a semi-barbarous country. A good school system is now considered so vital to the progress and development of the Puerto Rican people that the annual appropriation for educational purposes alone amounts to almost half of the total expenditures of the government. There are in the island today nearly 2,500 schools, including more than 2,000 with six or eight grades, about 30 which have ninth grade work, 16 accredited high schools offering four-year courses, and an up-to-date university. 5,000 teachers are employed, and a quarter of a million students are receiving regular instruction, including many who are sent to United States universities on scholarships. The percentage of illiteracy thus far has been reduced one-half and is steadily decreasing. The least progress, of course, has been made in the remote mountain regions, where the homes of the people are widely scattered and there are few good roads. In the cities, one half of the boys and girls of school age are going to school, but in the country, the proportion is only one fourth. Nevertheless, the accomplishments of the last 25 years have been so great that it will be but a comparatively short time before the school standards of Puerto Rico will be comparable with those of our states. That the people are intelligent and anxious to learn is shown by the progress made by the children and by the thousands of adults who attend night schools. Classes are maintained even in the prisons to teach the inmates to read and write. It is a striking fact that Puerto Rico is almost the only land of the Caribbean where the best and most modern buildings are schools and hospitals rather than palaces and national theaters. Here in San Juan, there are a fine new high school, many elementary and night schools, and an art school. They are built of reinforced concrete according to the latest standards of comfort and efficiency. In the other cities and towns of the island, I have seen the same handsome type of structure and many of them in the country districts as well. There, the large consolidated schools built to accommodate the pupils from a wide area are steadily replacing the old one-room buildings, some of which were so primitive that they could be distinguished from the thatched gibaro huts only by the american flag waving above them the stars and stripes fly over every puerto rican schoolhouse and each morning there is a ceremony of raising the flag as it goes up the children recite the salute that begins i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands the children seem proud of the fact that they are a part of our nation the pupils are anxious also to learn to speak English. Spanish is still the language of the people in their homes, and hardly any of the children know a word of English when they enter the first grade. The progress made in Puerto Rican education is all the more remarkable, therefore, when you consider the inevitable disadvantages that have had to be overcome owing to this fact. It is just as if all our children at home were obliged to go to schools where Spanish was the spoken language. There is a great demand in the stores and offices for English-speaking clerks, and many grown-up men and women who know only Spanish are trying to obtain at least a smattering of English. Books have been published that claim to teach our language in 30 lessons, but after looking through one of them, 
i must admit grave doubts as to their value here is a sample exercise copied word for word except that i have omitted the spanish equivalent printed with each sentence english what is your name pronunciation ua is iuna nine how old are you io od eight u what is the price of this ua is the price over this it is very dear it is very dear i will give you a dollar i will give in u e dollar that is not enough that is not enough speak slowly speak slowly you speak too fast you speak too fast this is a fine house this is ein fine house the system now followed in the schools is to teach the children oral english during the first three grades while the general instruction is carried on in spanish in the third grade english reading is introduced and after the fifth grade english is used as the medium of instruction with spanish taught as a separate subject nearly every eighth and ninth grade course now includes the teaching of certain manual arts here in san juan boys in these grades are taught mechanical drawing woodworking plumbing machine shop practice printing or electric wiring in the town of saint germain in the southwestern part of the island there is the polytechnic institute founded by a former presbyterian minister of which even the school buildings were erected by student labor when i was last in the philippines i visited similar schools all the work on which had been done by native boys girls as well as boys are offered actual experience in practical work of many kinds they are taught cooking the care of babies and invalids home management and hygiene hat making and sewing the hats woven here are much like panamas and puerto rican lace making and embroidery have long been well known in the united states indeed such work constitutes today the chief manufacturing industries on the island most of it is done by the women and girls in their homes on a piecework basis taken as a whole the puerto rican school systems incorporate all the various activities of ours in the united states parent teacher associations have been formed traveling libraries reach every part of the island school gardens are cultivated and vegetable exhibits held each year school savings accounts are encouraged and in many of the schools free noonday lunches are furnished although the average cost of one of these lunches is less than five cents the total amount spent last year for this purpose was about one hundred thousand dollars nevertheless the government has been more than repaid in the increased alertness and health of the children many a one of whom would otherwise have to go through the day sustained only by the fried plantain and cup of black coffee he had for breakfast how about athletics i asked the commissioner in the course of our conversation when we first took possession of the island he replied the children hardly knew how to play the puerto rican boy in the past rather looked down on athletic sports but now he is as devoted to them as our boys in the united states he belongs to a football team and he enjoys watching the growth of his biceps we have annual field games at which hundreds of students from different towns meet here at san juan for a big contest the puerto ricans are naturally musical and nearly every school has its band many of which are represented at the athletic meets at the last tournament some of the musicians were children eight years of age we are also establishing school playgrounds everywhere the commissioner continued and the day will come when every island school will have its gymnastic equipment as it is now the san juan playgrounds have kindergarten tents giant slides wings seesaws rope ladders in short just what you would see in your own schools in the smaller towns the equipment is not nearly so complete and sometimes is limited to one baseball outfit baseball is the most popular game in puerto rico and every school has its team leading the educational institutions of puerto rico is the university which now has an attendance of more than two thousand students except for the college of agriculture and mechanic arts which is located at mayaguez on the west coast most of the university buildings are at rio piedras seven miles from the capital there is a normal school for the training of teachers 
and colleges of law liberal arts and pharmacy here at san juan is also the new school of tropical science founded for the study of the diseases that have long ravaged puerto rico and other lands of the caribbean the greatest fight against disease in puerto rico is being waged against the hookworm through the united efforts of the insular government and the rockefeller foundation when the americans first came here they thought the puerto ricans were naturally lazy and inert but in 1900 a united states army surgeon discovered that almost the entire population of the highland regions were victims of hookworm this parasite they discovered gets into the intestines undermining the vigor of its victim and producing anemia a poor state of health lowers resistance to infection and during the shortage of food following the great hurricane of eighteen ninety nine the numbers afflicted with hookworm greatly increased owing to the absence of sanitary arrangements of any kind the ground in the mountains was polluted by the larvae of the hookworm the infection was contracted by these eggs entering the bodies of the victims through sores in their bare feet and making their way on through the system for this reason the measures taken in combating the disease had to include not only the distribution of medicine but also a campaign for elementary sanitation during the first six months of treatment by our medical men five thousand people were cured of hookworm and in a recent year the cures numbered thirty four thousand altogether more than a quarter of a million puerto ricans have been relieved of this affliction but still only one-fifth of the infected area has been cleaned up and the deaths from this cause number between seven hundred and one thousand a year the highest death rate in puerto rico at the present time is that due to tuberculosis which prevails here as the result of years of congested living unventilated rooms poor food and lack of hygienic knowledge in an effort to check the increase of the disease the government has established a tuberculosis sanitarium and several clinics on the other hand we have practically wiped out smallpox from the island when i first came here our government was in the middle of vaccinating every puerto rican there were hundreds of thousands of sore arms on the island during my stay and in some districts the people were so disabled that work practically stopped among the places i visited then was a farm where the army surgeons were inoculating two thousand cattle to produce vaccine the achievements that uncle sam has to his credit in puerto rico affect every phase of life religious social and commercial as well as educational and physical under united states rule modern labor legislation has been enacted complete freedom of religion ensured much of the graft eliminated from the courts and the trade of the island multiplied many times the annual exports are worth fifteen times as much now as they were in eighteen ninety seven and the combined imports and exports are greater than the total trade of all the central american republics put together and now just a word as to the way this island is governed its inhabitants are citizens of the united states with the privilege of voting under the governor who is an american appointed by the president are six executive departments headed by commissioners some also appointed by the president and some by the governor together with the governor these men form an executive council somewhat like our cabinet the laws are made by the council and by a legislature consisting of nineteen senators and thirty-nine representatives all elected by the people at washington the island is represented by a resident commissioner who has a seat but no vote in congress in the sessions of the legislature and in the courts the language used is spanish but all official documents and court records are printed in both spanish and english under spanish rule justice in puerto rico was determined largely by bribery and corruption nothing could be accomplished in the courts except by crossing the itching palms of the officials with silver or gold and this was so even to the recording of deeds and all transfers of property the poor had no rights that the rich were bound to respect and it cost money to obtain even a hearing in the courts at the time of my first visit 
there were two thousand prisoners in the jails awaiting trial many of whom hardly knew why they had been arrested one man had been held for five months for stealing an empty bag and another a year for making off with a chicken the courts then cost one hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year in salaries alone and every official drew a large allowance for incidentals i noticed that one hundred and eighty dollars was appropriated annually to pay for winding the clock in the city hall today all accounts are strictly audited and the court system has been thoroughly overhauled good order is kept everywhere the island being policed by an efficient force of about eight hundred men under united states army officers this organization is somewhat similar to the state constabularies of pennsylvania and new york except that it keeps the peace in both city and country the most noteworthy thing about puerto rico today is that the total annual appropriation needed to carry on all these activities of the government comes from the puerto rican treasury and not out of the pockets of uncle sam this little island has for many years paid its own way with the money raised by its own taxes and customs dues and it is not now costing the united states government anything except the expenses of the regiment of troops we keep there end of chapter twenty nine Chapter Thirty of Lands of the Caribbean by Frank G. Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Virgin Islands. Today I am in St. Thomas, the capital of the Virgin Islands. These are the newest possession of the United States and the last of the islands of the Caribbean that I shall visit. I am standing on the top of Bluebeard's Castle, a tall round stone tower that looks like a Dutch windmill minus its arms. It crowns the summit of a hill at the eastern end of the city and commands a magnificent view. Below me is the pear-shaped harbor, one of the best in the West Indies. To the right and left are other hills rising from the waterfront, and at my back is the half-moon ridge of mountains, 1,500 feet high, up the lower slopes of which climb the streets and structures of St. Thomas. This city was formerly known as Charlotte Amelie, having been named after the wife of king christian x of denmark but since nineteen seventeen when the islands were purchased from the danes by the united states the official name of the city has been the same as that of the island on the south shore of which it lies in the shape of its horseshoe sweep around the bay and in the riotous colors in which it has been painted by both man and nature the city of st thomas reminds me of algiers most of the buildings are white and have red roofs, but there are also many tinted in the brightest of rainbow hues. Down on the waterfront, the old Danish fortress, now the jail and police station, makes a vivid splash of crimson, and farther up on the slopes, buildings of yellow, gray, orange, and blue stand out against a background of green. St. Thomas is built on four hills. The three most prominent of these can be seen far out on the ocean and are called by sailors foretop main top and mizzen top on one of them burns two beacon lights to guide ships into the harbor if a pilot keeps these lights in line before him he knows that he is following the right course another of the peaks is known as frenchman's hill having been named for a party of huguenots who once found in this island a place of refuge their descendants are still living here a little band of pure whites who have never intermarried with the colored population. The central portion of St. Thomas is grouped about the eminence known as Government Hill. There are the governor's residence, the government offices, and the best homes of the city. Most of the houses are of brick or stone, and not a few are handsome and commodious, with wide verandas overlooking tropical gardens of palms, shrubs, and brilliant masses a blooming hibiscus and bougainvillea on government hill is also a castle that legend says was once the residence of edward teach the pirate whose depredations were feared from one end of the caribbean to the other about the close of the seventeenth and the beginning of the eighteenth centuries teach was a gentleman of the high seas who began his career under the black flag at port royal jamaica and rose to be the very napoleon of piracy 
he terrorized the islands of the west indies to such an extent that a price of one hundred pounds sterling was offered by the british for his capture dead or alive this sum was more than twice as much as the reward put upon the head of any ordinary pirate it was teach who was described in tom kringle's log as being the mildest mannered man who ever scuttled ship or cut a throat history however does not bear out this statement and most accounts unite in pronouncing him a fiend incarnate with most diabolical ideas of humor the name by which he is known far and wide came from the long coal-black beard that covered most of his face one of his favorite practices to add to the fearsomeness of his appearance was to twist his beard into pigtails tied with bright ribbon and another to stick phosphorescent matches into it to frighten people by their glow he was not above robbing or murdering members of his own crew during a drinking bout it was not at all unusual for him to snuff out the lights and then to shoot at random into the darkness in what he called a friendly way if i did not kill one of you now and then he once said you would forget who i am at another time as a joke he marooned seventeen of his men on a desert island where they would have starved to death had they not been accidentally discovered by a passing vessel in seventeen eighteen blackbeard's ship was finally cornered in an inlet on the coast of north carolina by a sloop of the british navy and the notorious pirate was killed after a terrific hand-to-hand -hand fight with his severed head hung up at the bow of their ship as a gory trophy of the encounter the english then proceeded to bath town north carolina where the captured pirates were hanged the only member of blackbeard's gang to escape extermination was a man who had been left behind nursing a knee shattered by one of the bullets scattered by the old pirate in one of his playful moods although there is little doubt that this part of the caribbean was often the scene of blackbeard's bloody exploits the assertions that he lived here is probably based more on fancy than on fact history says the castle that bears his name was really built by a danish resident of st thomas in the latter part of the seventeenth century and that the same is true of bluebeard's tower bluebeard is said to have been another pirate of the caribbean but less is known about him than of blackbeard the slopes on which st thomas is built are so steep that many of the streets leading from the hills to the waterfront are flights of stone steps alongside which are open gutters st thomas has as yet neither water nor sanitary systems but nevertheless most of the streets look clean and well cared for the rains as a rule being sufficient to wash away the refuse the only level thoroughfare in the city is that along the harbor at the foot of the hills here behind rows of coconut palms are the principal shops and stores with few exceptions they are small one-story buildings with no show windows and no modern furnishings in this part of the city is also the best hotel a white two-story structure facing what is known as emancipation park where band concerts are given as we stroll along this street we can see something of the people of st thomas now and then we pass a man or woman of our own race dressed much as we are or a united states marine in uniform but the blacks and mulattoes outnumber the whites more than ten to one the most common masculine costume consists of a shirt and a pair of cotton trousers probably once white but now dirty gray the native women wear a sort of mother hubbard garment tied at the waist and a turban swathed about the head often topped by a wide-brimmed straw hat the majority of the people are barefooted occasionally we meet an automobile or a carriage but as wheeled vehicles can be used on few of the streets most of the traffic moves on foot here is a tiny donkey with a little bare-legged black boy astride his back and across the street is another drawing a two-wheeled cart everywhere are negro men and women boys and girls with burdens on their heads look at that child of eight with a huge tin bucket resting on her woolly pate and see that little boy carrying a demijohn in the same manner here comes a dusky laundress with a great basket of washed clothes balanced on her crown 
and further on is one bearing a tray of fruit indeed there seems to be no limit to the kinds of burdens borne in this way even to fish raw meat and squawking chickens in the shade of trees or buildings are women who squat all day beside the little piles of yams peppers limes or joints of sugarcane they hope to sell the profit on the entire stock of one of these street merchants can be but a few cents here we are at the docks let us stop and watch the native boys dive for coins there is always a crowd of such urchins meeting ships and boats and a piece of money flipped into the water will draw a score of them after it i doubt if any money is ever lost in this way for no matter where a coin is thrown one of the boys is sure to come up clutching it tightly in his hand of more interest than the divers are the women coaling that steamer tied up at the wharf all this work is done by strapping negresses who carry the coal to the ship in baskets on their heads look at that procession of them going back and forth over the gangplank they are blacker if possible than their black diamond burdens the baskets hold about sixty pounds of coal each but the women balance them as lightly as though they were filled with feathers, rarely using their hands to steady them. These female stevedores, wearing cotton or gingham, and barefooted, and with naked arms, sing and laugh as they march back and forth in a never-ending stream. Their talk is almost unintelligible, being a jargon of Dutch, French, English, and Spanish, but their good spirits are unmistakable. The harbor of St. Thomas is one of the best in the West Indies. It is almost enclosed by the projecting peninsula on each side and is further protected from the sea by an outer fringe of small islands. One of these islands is known as Sail Rock because when viewed from the east, it has the exact appearance of a vessel under full sail. The story is told that once upon a time, the commander of a French frigate who sighted the rock at night mistook it for a privateering ship and opened fire upon it. The echoes returned the noise of his cannonade, making him think that his fire was being answered, and it is said that not until dawn did he realize his foolish mistake. The water in the bay is now as smooth as a mill pond, and the harbor would seem to be an ideal shelter for shipping of all kinds. The truth is that even the high hills all about do not protect it from hurricanes which occasionally cause frightful damage in these islands. One of the most severe cyclones occurred not long after the close of our Civil War, while the United States was negotiating for the purchase of the Virgin Islands from Denmark. At that time, among other disasters, was numbered the one in which a great wave picked up the U.S. frigate Monongahela and set it down high and dry on the shores of the island of St. Croix. That tornado was largely instrumental in turning American sentiment against the purchase of the islands, and probably was to a certain extent responsible for the refusal of our Senate to ratify the treaty that had been negotiated with Denmark at that time. Another terrific hurricane which struck St. Thomas in October 1916 was in some respects even more destructive. It stripped the vegetation from the hills of the island, wrecked many ships in the harbor, cast smaller boats on the shore, and tore dozens of houses from their foundations. Trees were uprooted, sheet iron roofs were torn off buildings and sent hurtling through the air, and telephone wires were dashed to the ground. Hundreds of people were left without a single possession except the clothes they wore, and the destruction of fruit trees and crops took away their chief sources of food. Today, the buildings of St. Thomas have hurricane doors and shutters, and the city has adopted a code of signals to warn the people when a cyclone is believed imminent. We end our exploration of St. Thomas by a trip on ponyback to the top of the mountain ridge behind the city. From the crest of this ridge, we can see not only all over the island, but can obtain glimpses also of other lands in all directions. Only 40 miles to the west, across the Virgin Passage, are the heights of Puerto Rico, and nearer still, our little island of Culebra, past which we steamed on our way from San Juan to St. Thomas. Culebra came into our possession with Puerto Rico. It is sometimes used by our Navy as a base in war maneuvers. That hazy outline rising out of the Caribbean to the south is St. Croix, and the little island only a few miles off the east coast of St. Thomas 
is St. John. The Virgin Islands of the United States consist of the three larger islands of St. Croix, St. Thomas, and St. John, together with about 50 smaller ones. These latter dot the blue waters of the Caribbean so thickly that when Columbus touched here on his second voyage, he despaired of having enough saints' names to go around, and so proclaimed the whole group to be under the sacred patronage of the 11,000 martyred virgins of St. Ursula. Since then, the saintly names of many of the islands have been replaced by such designations as Rum Island, Dead Man's Chest, Dutch Man's Cap, Fallen Jerusalem, and Saltwater Money Rock. All these waters once swarmed with pirates and buccaneers, and many an island here has been dug up by modern adventurers looking for buried treasure. From the time of Columbus's visit until Sir Walter Raleigh touched here in 1587, there is no record of any white man landing in the Virgins, and the first settlement was not made until 1625. After that, however, the islands changed hands so often that during the next two centuries the flags of six different nations waved over them. Holland founded a colony here at the same time that New Amsterdam was established, and France, Spain, and Sweden held one or another of the islands at different times. Although the ones we now own were occupied by Denmark in 1666, it was not until 1816 that the country's claim was acknowledged by England, which had taken and held them for varying periods on three different occasions. Great Britain still owns several of the islands in the Virgin Group northeast of St. Thomas, and sailing sloops from there come here daily, selling fruit, vegetables, charcoal, embroideries, and drawn work. The sheltered coves of one of those islands, called Anagata, furnished protection for many an English pirate during the 17th century. There it was that Sir Francis Drake often lay in wait for the Spanish treasure galleons making their way out to the Atlantic, and there also was wrecked the fleet of Prince Rupert of the Rhine after his brief but bloody career of piracy. This island of St. Thomas, while possessing the best harbor in the Virgins, is of little importance from an agricultural or industrial standpoint. From east to west it measures only 13 miles, and from north to south but two or three. There are no rivers or ponds on it, and the rocky hills are but sparsely covered with vegetation. There are no forests and few cultivated patches. Most of the people on the island live in or near the city, and there is only an occasional habitation elsewhere. The largest, richest, and most thickly populated of the virgins is St. Croix, 40 miles to the southward. Not so mountainous as St. Thomas, its rolling hills provide pasture for herds of cattle, and its rich soil raises sugar cane, coconuts, fruits, and sea island cotton. Cane is by far the most important crop, the sugar produced there constituting the chief export from the islands. St. Croix has better roads than St. Thomas or St. John and shows more signs of industrial progress. Modern steam mills have replaced the antiquated windmills once used for grinding sugar. A station of the United States Department of Agriculture has been established there for the study of crops and farming methods, and there is even a labor union among the plantation mill workers. St. Croix suffers the disadvantage of not having a good harbor at either of its two ports of Frederickstead and Christiansted, which are located at opposite ends of the island, about 20 miles apart. Frederickstead was once visited by Lafcadio Hearn and was said by him to be a beautiful city, a description that hardly fits it today. Christiansted was formerly the seat of the Danish government of the island. Its chief interest to most Americans is that Alexander Hamilton lived there during his boyhood. Hamilton was born on the little island of Nevis, but was sent to Christiansted when only 12 years old to work as a clerk in a counting house. It was while he was so employed that he witnessed and wrote an account of the great hurricane of 1772, thus revealing such pronounced literary talent that he was sent to Boston in the North American colonies to complete his education. St. John, the smallest of the three main islands of the Virgins, is only nine miles long and about half as wide, and has less than a thousand inhabitants. 
most of the sugar plantations it once had were destroyed during the slave insurrection of 1733, and today the chief industry is gathering the leaves of the bay tree, which grows wild there. These leaves, which are used for making bay rum, are collected by children who climb the trees and break off the twigs. They are then distilled to obtain the oil in them. Bay rum is made from this oil mixed with white rum or with alcohol, or sometimes by distilling the leaves directly into alcohol. The amount produced annually in recent years has varied in value between thirty and eighty thousand dollars. Most of it is purchased by the British. Industrially and commercially unimportant as they are, the virgins were bought by the United States during the World War because of their position at the eastern gateway to the Caribbean. Except for their strategic value, Uncle Sam has little to show for the $25 million he paid for them. St. Thomas has lost the position of relative importance it once occupied in the trade of the Caribbean. Under the Danes, the city was practically a free port, and as such was a point of entry for merchandise to be reshipped to other islands of the Antilles. Now, with cables and telegraphs facilitating direct sales, this business has fallen off and the use of fuel oil on ships has lowered St. Thomas's value as a coaling station. An oil depot has been established here to supply ships, and there are also a floating dock, a shipyard, and repair shops. Nevertheless, the vessels that stop here are but few compared with the number that once put in at this harbor. In the meantime, the production of the islands has been falling off. A large export tax on sugar has lowered the profit on this crop and discouraged cane growers, and the application of our Volstead Act to the islands has prohibited the manufacture of rum as a beverage. Bay rum is still made in St. Thomas, but under heavy restrictions. The islands are far from being self-supporting, although they might be made more nearly so by improved farming and labor conditions and by better roads and marketing facilities. St. Thomas needs sanitary works, and all three islands need more and better schools. Indeed, there are few evidences here of American ownership such as I saw in Puerto Rico. The street signs of St. Thomas are still printed in Danish. The traditions and customs of Denmark's rule continue to prevail, and Danish money is in use. Even the old Danish laws are in force, insofar as is compatible with the changed sovereignty and to determine just what are the limits of this compatibility has often caused confusion and misunderstanding. The Virgin Islands are governed as two municipalities, one of St. Croix and the other of St. Thomas and St. John combined. There is a naval station at St. Thomas and detachments of Marines are kept on the islands to maintain order. The governor is appointed by the President of the United States and functions in connection with the Colonial Council for each municipality. Some members of these councils are appointed by the governor, but the majority are elected by the people. The citizens entitled to vote must be older than 25 years and of good character, must have resided here five years or more, and must have an income of at least $300 a year. The fact that out of 27,000 people, but comparatively few can meet this requirement speaks eloquently of the general poverty of the population. The end. End of chapter 30. End of Lands of the Caribbean by Frank G. Carpenter.